have a plan, make the most of your situation, plan and then speak into a pivot, speak into those activations in your community, figure out what those assets are that are going to be desirable for travelers right now and lean into them and figure out as a town how you can come together and make this a place that people want to travel right now. Okay, guys, since we started the Destination Marketing Podcast a little over a year ago, I've had several destinations reach out and say, hey, could you help me start a podcast? And at first we were kind of like, well, no, that's not really what we do. But after enough requests, we said, you know what, let's explore this. And we've created a turnkey program for destinations where we will produce, we will host, we will edit, and we will publish your podcast for your destination on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis. Uh, And all you have to do is show up and answer some questions. Uh, We're really excited about this program. We've got a few destinations that have been doing really, really well with their podcast. Uh, And if you've ever thought about creating a podcast for your destination, but you don't have all the equipment or you don't have uh, the the expertise or, or any of that type of stuff, let us take that off your hands. Let, let Relic handle your podcast creation and production. And all you have to do is show up and answer questions about all the amazing things there are to do within your destination. So let me know if you're interested. Email me at adam at relicagency.com and we'll get you set up on this podcast program. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Destination Marketing Podcast. As we were last week, we are on the road this week with our friends at Franklin, Tennessee. We're with Lauren Ward. Lauren, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're excited to have you on. Uh, We are here at a great restaurant in Franklin called Puckett's. Tell me about Puckett's. Puckett's. We love Puckett's. Everybody loves Puckett's. Um, it really is the heart, one of the, the main kind of go-to restaurants for downtown Franklin. Um, it's been here for a long time. They've expanded, and they have um, locations across the state of Tennessee. Okay. But um, their locations here in Franklin are the original. So um, they were born here. They're a very strong kind of family-friendly restaurant. Um, they're a tight-knit staff, and they really show that southern hospitality to our guests whenever they come you come in and you smell the barbecue as soon as you walk in and you know you're going to have a good you know home cooked southern meal so nice. that's why I chose Puckett's because it really kind of shows that uh, southern comfort food and that friendly nature that we have in Franklin oh perfect okay so you would classify this as a barbecue restaurant then Yes, they're known for barbecue and burgers, um, but you know you can get a good like meat and three. I don't know if any of our if anyone outside of the South listening. To yeah, this I'm knows not what familiar a, you know with the meat three. and three. <laughs> I'd okay. love to hear. Okay, I'll educate you on a meat and three. Okay. Um, meat and three is <laughs> basically how it sounds. So a piece of meat, typically like fried chicken, something like that, barbecue, and then three sides. And so it's like macaroni and cheese fried okra, green beans, so basically vegetables or starch with a meat, and that's like a staple southern meal. Okay, and what's your go-to here? Oh my gosh, I honestly, I always go for their burger. I think that they have the best burger in town. Okay. Yeah, I love their barbecue's really good too, Um, and they have a really, a special mac and cheese called Piggy Mac. Piggy Mac. Piggy Mac. It's delicious. Okay, what's Piggy Mac? Um, so it has bacon in it. Don't ask me what else, because that's the only thing. <laughs> that's the important that ingredient. The most important <laughs> and Mac, so I don't know what else you could ask for, but um, those are probably my favorites. Okay, we got to yeah. try the Piggy Mac oh, then. Yeah. All we right. Do, for sure. Um, so, as far as Puckett's being here in Franklin, what other dining establishments are there uh, that, that are pretty popular here? So um, another very popular spot is Gray's on Main. It's right around the corner from us on Main Street. Okay. And we're sitting right now in the heart of our historic district. Um, it's this beautiful like storybook. Look at me selling Franklin. As <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> historic kind of Main Street district. And Gray's is an old pharmacy. So they have a sign outside that used to be the, the pharmacy sign. Um, but they turned it in, re- renovated it, turned it into a restaurant many years ago. And that's a little bit more of an upscale dining experience, but they still have a lot of those southern kind of staple comfort foods, too. Okay. Um, and there's a pretty, it runs, the food scene runs the gamut here. So it's everything from those 
um, you know, small kind of expected barbecue places, I guess, that you see in the South, all the way to some fine dining. Like there's a spot out in Leapers Fork, which is 15 minutes from here, called 1892. Beautiful kind of upscale experience. There's another um, place right down the street called Cork and Cow. So there's some fine dining, but then there's also like, you know, come as you are, wear your flip flops and your tank top, and you know, come on in and eat some barbecue. Awesome, so. awesome. Well, I I think the dining in Franklin sounds like like there's a lot to offer. It was probably yeah. hard to choose just one restaurant yes, for us was. to eat at today. It was for sure. Well, you know what? Let's order some food, uh, and then we'll we'll get that going. And and when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about Franklin as a destination. Sounds good. Okay, welcome back, everybody. We got the food ordered, so we're all set here at Puckett's. Uh, we, we ordered the burger, the Piggy Mac, uh, and we also are going to try the uh, queso. They, what did they call it? it do you remember? <laughs> we pull out that menu. I don't remember. Uh, it's, it's the smoked, smoked. pepper queso. Yes. It sounded pretty intriguing. So while we wait for that, I want to talk a little bit about Franklin as a destination and also a little bit about you and your role uh, okay. at the CVB. So let's start with you, uh, Lauren. We've got some questions we like to ask everybody that comes on the show. Uh, even though we're on the road, we're still going to do it here with you. So if you could go anywhere in the world, Lauren, where would that be? I am going to say Greece. I have honestly not traveled a lot outside of the country. I've been to a lot of different destinations across the U.S., but there's something about Greece that I've always, I've said since high school probably that I want to go to Greece. I just have this picture in my mind of like the view of the ocean with the white houses. You know, you can kind of yep. see that scene. Um, I would love to go to Greece, but I honestly would really love to go anywhere in Europe because I have not, the only places I've been outside of the country are Mexico and then the Caribbean, which are amazing because I'm a big beach person. Right. Um, but I'm, I'm ready to expand my travel adventures in the years to come. So So I, I too, have never been to Europe, and I've always wanted to go. Uh, I started out thinking, oh, Europe would be interesting. Yeah. Right? And then about a year and a half ago when I started the podcast, everybody kept saying Europe, Europe, Europe. And I hear all these different amazing things that you can do there. And Greece has been actually a really popular answer really? on the show. Really? Yeah. Yes. And so it has climbed higher up my list now than, than it was before. So, yeah, great answer there. Yeah. Uh, tell me about, you, you mentioned a couple trips you've been on. Tell me about what you feel like is kind of that favorite trip that really stands out for you. I'm going to have to say Aruba. Um, we went to Aruba on our honeymoon, and it was just perfect. I mean, it was, again, I'm a big beach person, but the water is crystal clear and the sand is bright white, and there's a nice breeze, just constant breeze coming off of the ocean. Um, it was just amazing. The people were really friendly. There was a great little marketplace shopping and the food, and it was just a really wonderful experience. So oh, that sounds probably amazing. my favorite. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So excursions, when you were in Aruba, was there anything that you did other than laying on the beach, or what, what yeah. was your main thing there? Mainly laying on the beach, to be honest. <laughs> but we did do snorkeling, which is a pretty, you know, typical thing to do. Yep. Um, and then we went out and just kind of did some exploring on foot, like shopping, that kind of thing. So I wish I could, um, I wish we would have done more, but we were, we had Sorry. gotten on our honeymoon, so we were in definitely a relaxation state. So we spent a lot of time just out on the beach. Good for you. What yeah. a great place to spend your honeymoon. Oh, yeah. It was perfect. It awesome. was wonderful. Yeah. On, on our honeymoon, we, uh, we drove to California from Utah. And I think if there's one thing I would do differently, I would have gone somewhere and stayed somewhere because so much of our honeymoon was spent in yeah, the Yeah, oh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You learn as you go, yeah, right? Yeah, true. <laughs> true. Well, tell me a little bit about you and your background and how you got into tourism. Yeah, so um, I started my career at a communications agency in downtown Nashville. So I was in the agency world like you for nice. a little while. Um, I was there for uh, almost 10 years. I started my career there and stayed right after college, which I know is kind of odd for a 22-year-old. Um, but I just loved it there. I worked with a lot of different clients in all different industries, but I never worked with a tourism client. Um, I did an internship in college with the Knoxville Tourism and Sports Corporation. That's okay. what it was called at the time, which is in East Tennessee. Yep. like few hours from here so I'd had a taste of tourism but over my 10 years at the agency I hadn't done a lot in the tourism world um, 
but this job came open here in Franklin and it just sounded fun to be and honest. What's your with role? You. I am the vice president of marketing and communications. Perfect. So I oversee I came from the agency world running accounts mainly on the PR marketing side um, and then took that PR marketing experience and related it to the tourism industry. Um, which you know you can relate marketing experience really to any industry, but tourism yeah. definitely has its um, you know intricacies that I've learned over the past few years. So I've been with Visit Franklin for a little over three years now, um, and just absolutely love everything about working for a destination marketing organization. Like you're never going to get me out of tourism <laughs> at this point because it's just fun. I just tell people it's just fun. I just love my job. I feel like the and everyone's happy, right? Like. Everybody in the tourism industry just is generally a happy person because they're promoting things that they love to do in their town, and travel is happy, and I just really like being in that space. Yep. I I love this industry, and, and you make some great points. I, I actually feel like when you're in school, and, and maybe this is just naivete on my part, but nobody ever said there's an entire industry around marketing destinations that you can get into. I mean, I had no idea. Yeah. So it sounds like you, like me, kind of stumbled upon it and said, wow, this is this is really cool. I and did, yeah. I, it's funny you say I'm never getting out of tourism because I feel the same way. Like, I, I think you would have to pry me out of this yeah. industry at this point. Oh, yeah. Sorry to everybody that doesn't enjoy the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I feel the same way. Well, so you got into your role. That was mm -hmm. three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. For the first two years, you probably had, you know, business was booming in the industry and everything, mm -hmm. the sustained growth. Tell me what that time was like, and then kind of, as we transitioned into the COVID area, era, what, what that was like for you. Yeah, so, um, you know, Franklin has seen, from a tourism perspective, has seen a lot of growth over the past several years, definitely the past five to seven years in particular. We are right outside of Nashville, but we have really branded ourselves separately from Nashville, and we have a totally different experience than Nashville does. So Nashville has this amazing you know, nightlife scene, honky-tonks, bright lights, bachelorette parties, just super fun. And then we are more of a quaint, kind of charming, small town, slow down, relaxed feel. Yeah. So we work really well with Nashville um, because we offer something that they don't, and they offer something that we don't. So that has worked well for us as far as growth is concerned because Nashville has blown up in the past 10 years and we've enjoyed some of that growth as well. Um, but then we've also gotten a really, you know, aggressive marketing plan on the, you know, for us individually. So we're able to capitalize off the Nashville business, but then we're going after our own business as well um, pretty hard. So we saw a lot of growth, you know, the first two years that I was here. Um, we're shooting for 2 million. We were shooting for 2 million visitors by the end of 2020. We're very close to that. We're at 1.81 million right now. Um, even with COVID. Even with COVID. Wow. Yes, which is great. Congrats. So thanks. We're still going for that 2 million goal. Hopefully 2021 will be our year. Um, but, you know, it was just on the up. And there's been a lot that's been changing, you know, that's visitor facing around Franklin that we've gotten involved in um, from a development standpoint over the past couple of years, too because the industry has moved, you know, a lot of marketers have just been in that promotion business, pr you know, branding and promoting your destination, but so much of it has moved to really developing, speaking into the development of the destination yeah. too. So we had really gotten in that groove of um, the research and figuring out, you know, what could be lacking in Franklin that we could benefit from from a development standpoint. What research did you do? Uh, were, were you, I mean, was this... Did it start as general research and then kind of narrow down as you went? Or, or how, how did you guys come up with your research plan? So we worked with, as I'm sure a lot of other destinations have, with destination analysts. Yep. Um, I will promote them all day long. They're amazing. They did some incredible research for us. Um, but they did some visitor profiling, um, you know, and then we were able to kind of cull from that research what we, you know, what the visitor is missing here. Um, in particular, so we took that and have been able to work with our local chamber and developers to say, hey, we need a couple more friend, you know, family-friendly options, or um, you know, we need a few, we need to beef up our culinary scene, et cetera. So I feel like just as the pandemic started, we were kind of really getting rolling on the development side. We were already rolling on the marketing side, and you know, downtown is booming and busy. Um, and then here comes COVID. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's 
been a shock to our industry as a whole. Definitely, you know, a shock to Franklin. Visitation completely dropped off and the occupancy in our hotels. Um, we've seen a very slow but steady climb back, um, you know, which is nice to see a little bit of a bump. But we just know it's going to take quite a bit of time. It's not something that's going to bounce back overnight. You know, it'll take a couple of years to really get back to pre-COVID. That was the hardest pill to swallow, I think, was realizing this is not going to be a six-month bounce back. But we're going to really have to be patient, make sure that we're handling our marketing, you know, responsibly, fiscally responsibly, um, which I can talk through some of that in a little bit if you'd yeah, like, but just make sure that we're doing that the right way to help with this long-term recovery because it's not going to be a quick bounce back. So how do you feel like your agency experience for those 10 years prepared you to have to navigate this as, as the vice president of marketing for Franklin? That is a great question. Um, so when you're working, it, as you know, when you're working it at an agency with a lot of different clients, you have to be flexible. You have to be ready for anything. You know, you get a call in the middle of the night. There's a, I've worked in crisis communications for a long time. So, <laughs> so you got calls literally in the calls in the middle of the night. Um, you know, so you just I feel like everyone is using the word pivot and flexible right now. But that is just the truth of it. You know, just being able to. Um, vary from the path that you're on and make a plan that you also know is going to change at the same time like you can't not plan because things are unstable you have to still plan but right. you have to have a have that flexibility and that's very much it's really similar to what I did with client work um, because it changed you know so much in the in agency life is just planning but understanding that that is probably not it's probably not going to go that way and we need to have a plan b and c and d yeah I I love that you still planned, even though you knew it was probably not going to go as planned. Yeah. Like, you got to do something. Right. You can't just sit back <laughs> Maybe and wait until it's over. Maybe that's my type A. You know, I've got to at least have something on paper. i got to have something here. Yep, yep. Um, you and I are very similar there. Yeah. Well, our queso just came out, and it looks amazing. Why don't we take a little break, and we'll jump back in. Sounds good. Okay, everybody, we've been talking about recovery for a while now, and my team at Relic has been working on recovery campaigns for several destinations over the last couple of months. They've actually developed a pretty amazing, we'll call it an algorithm, to know when it's safe to do acquisition marketing in a market. And so what I mean by that is you've got government regulations, you've got, uh, you know, how is the virus affecting that market, whether there's been a decrease in cases or a decrease in deaths in that market, when is it safe to advertise, hey, come to our destination? Uh, like I said, our team has come up with this algorithm to provide that information for you, and we're offering a free market report. We're calling it Recovery Triggers. And if you'd like a free Recovery Trigger report for your target market where you want to draw visitors from, please email me directly at adam at relicagency.com or you can go to recoverytriggers.relicagency.com and we'll get you set up with a free report and we even have the ability to send you a weekly recurring report so you can see what's happening in that market on a weekly basis and make sure you're launching your acquisition campaign at the perfect time. Okay, we've just had our first experience with the smoked pepper queso. Pretty darn good. Very good. Delicious. <laughs> yeah, but we might have to take a few more breaks to, to finish that up. Um, but, you know, this this place really seems like it's got a great atmosphere. I've kind of seen all the people coming and going as, as we've been here, and uh, the food sure looks great, So and, and the, the queso is great. Excited for the burger and stuff to get here. Yeah, you're going to love it. It's amazing. Well, let's get back into some of the, some of the stuff that we were talking about with COVID, because you know, it, it sounds like you guys took a very intentional approach uh, to COVID and, and how you navigated uh, the situation. You've been in crisis communications before, so this was kind of in your wheelhouse. Uh, tell me kind of step by step how you approached this. Well, I have to first of all give, you know, the majority of their credit to our president and CEO. Her name's Ellie Westman Chin. She's an incredible leader and she's not only led our organization through this, but really, you know, the entire tourism industry here in Williamson County has been 
I think, looking to her for her leadership and guidance in a lot of ways. Um, So, you know, right when COVID hit, we pivoted our, you know, kind of face to our partners um, and tried to become a resource for them. So the first thing we did is... Can I I stop you real quick? Yeah, sure. So I've heard that a lot. I want to know kind of how that conversation came about. Like, what were the... What, what meetings led to that decision of, you know what, we've got to get information out quicker and, and all of that? It was almost instinctual. I, that sounds odd, but, um, you know, we've always been so focused on this is our marketing plan, this is how we're moving forward. So there, there were kind of some obvious things that needed to happen immediately that just happened that day where it's like we need to take down our advertising, we need to put up an information page on our website, we need to do some things in the visitor center. Like, there were just some immediate things that we just knew that we needed to do. And right after we got through with that, um, we just we needed that information from our partners to be able to serve it to the visitor. And then we also needed to know how we could support them at the same time. Makes sense. It's kind of a dual purpose. So it's how are we having providing the most up-to-date information to our visitors. And that the best way to do that, obviously, is through connecting with our partners. But then also... Um, we want to support them however we can because this is an incredibly tough time on all these small businesses down here. It is vital to our, um, you know, the health of our tourism industry that they stay open and healthy and they bounce back as quickly as possible. So whatever we can do to support them and make sure they stay alive during this time is very important to us too. So it just was a natural fit. Yeah, yeah. I was chatting with with Missy, one of the business owners here in the, in the downtown district before we met today, and and she was talking a little bit about what that experience was like. And and man, as as a business owner, to to be able to get those constant updates from the DMO, it it's got to be such a relief when you're not really sure what to do. So so good on you guys for for taking that leadership role. Um, from a tactical standpoint, was it email? Did you guys have a social media group that you communicate within? What were your tactics for getting that word out? Well, it was email, first of all, as far as updates were concerned. But then we we have a staff of 13 full-time. We literally divided up the entire staff and divided up our partner list. And we got on the phone and we we called every single one of our partners. I like it. Um, we just wanted to... we. This was a conversation that could not happen over email, and we wanted to connect with them and really hear from them what was happening. So we each took a section. We cover the county as a whole, so it's not just Franklin. We have um, six communities total. Okay. So we each took a community or a sector and just started calling through those lists. We created a um, you know, shared sheet where we went in and just put our updates in, and then we continued to update the full staff as we were getting information in, and all of that funneled to our website. Um, so that was kind of the visitor-facing piece. There was constant updates on our site, though, um, from a safety perspective. You know, as far as mandates were concerned, um, health and safety practices, like we were updating that on a daily basis. So we were really trying to stay on top of that. And then probably once a week or twice a week, we would have email communication out to our partners, just letting them know what was happening as far as small business loans were concerned. Um, we worked with, we created a list of places that were hiring so that people that had to lay off their staff at restaurants or, or hotels could send their people a link for employment. I love that. that um, that's something, so I've heard a lot of these tactics before. Um, the job board, I haven't heard a lot of, and, and I'm yeah. glad that you guys did that. We did, yeah. And then we ended up partnering with our local chamber and they hosted it on their website. Um, so we would send all kinds of updates out that way and then we've also gathered a lot of information through email since then with surveys we've done some mask sentiment surveys um, asking people their percentage of visitor versus resident through this time it's really helped us to have that you know information back from them as we're working on our marketing strategy moving forward you know I keep hearing that research that you guys are, are doing a lot of research and listening uh, where did that strategy come from? Is that, did that come from your agency days, or is that something that you know Franklin has always done? Wh- where did that strategy come from? I guess it's been at the heart of you know the DMO and what what Visit Franklin has done since the start. It's just kind of a basic marketing principle that is easy to forget. I think a lot of people just move forward on information that they think or assume is true. 
Um, but as a team, we've always gone back to the research. Um, I've always thought that way. Ellie, our president, has thought that way. Our digital brand manager, her name's Courtney. She is loves analytics and is deep into the research. So having her on board during this time has been vital because she has often, you know, we'll try to run off in a certain direction and she'll pull us back and say, why don't we just send out a survey? Why don't we just ask people what they think? So she's checked us a couple times on that. Nice. Um, but it's, I, I think some of it probably does come from agency days as well. It's just natural for me to think research first before we build a strategy. I love it. You know, one of the reasons that I feel like research is so critical right now is that personas, target personas, have changed for a lot of destinations. The people that were willing to come before just aren't willing to come anymore. Uh, and, and people that weren't willing to come before may be willing now, right? And so from a research standpoint, I think it's so important to be exploring the answers to those questions because uh, otherwise we could be marketing to the wrong people and marketing is getting the right message to the right people at the right time. It sounds simple. It's a lot harder than that. Right. But but it sounds like you guys are doing the important listening and research that needs to happen in order to nail getting the right people, or excuse me, the right message to the right people. Well, thanks. We're trying. Um, you know, we don't always succeed and do it right every time, but I something that I have to continuously remind myself is to update that, that research because you'll live off of, I think a lot of DMOs live off of three to five year old research, yes. which I would say three years is fine for a large, you know, research piece. But there's so much that you can glean from just small surveys, you know, not, you know, you want to have that larger research with a partner after several years, but just send out a survey via social, send out a survey to your partners through SurveyMonkey. It's an easy thing to do. So I'm trying to be better at gleaning that information and listening more over time on a more regular basis instead of just basing my assumptions off of something we heard two years ago. Yeah, research is never done. Exactly. Right? Yes. Yeah, totally. Well, the burger is here. The piggy mac is here. And I think we got to give it a try. So yeah. we're going to come back in just a few minutes and, and keep it going with Franklin, Tennessee. Sounds good. Okay, Lauren, now that we all need a nap. Yes. <laughs> Please. That burger was amazing. What a great recommendation. Thank you. I'm glad you like it. Um, and, and the piggy mac. Turns out it was it was pulled pork in there. Mm -hmm. I was wrong. I knew it was something <laughs> from a pig. Close enough. Uh, it's just deliciousness. It was amazing. So, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll do this last segment, and then we'll go take a little nap. Great. I'm in. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Well, so we were talking before just, just kind of how you guys approached research and, you know, how you how you tackled COVID as an organization one of the things that you did was was you talked about the leadership coming from the ceo of the the cvb tell me what it is about that leadership style that has made a difference for you guys great question um look i'm like interviewing you I'm like great question adam <laughs> i like it i'll take compliments i'm not scared um i say great question because i love talking about this because i um you know, the type of leader that your organization has makes all the difference in the success, I think, of the DMO and their positioning in the community, um, the way that people value what you're doing. I think the CEO's relationships and the way that she gets out there, she or he, we have a female uh, CEO, so I'm saying she, but the way that she or he gets out there in the community and um, you know, with your stakeholders and talks about the importance of tourism, somebody who knows how to do that and to fight for you and to fight for tourism is so important. Um, but internally, she leads, she's a very strong leader, but she's so unbelievably approachable. She hires people that she trusts to do the job, and then she basically gets out of their way. Um, and I mean that in a very positive way. She hires the right people, and then she steps back, and she creates um, an environment of creativity and a place where no idea is off the table. It doesn't matter what you know position you're in or level you are. Everybody has something to bring to the table. So marketing needs to contribute to sales. Sales need to, needs to contribute to the visitor center, et cetera. 
Um, and she does that because she steps back in a sense, provides that groundwork and kind of those boundaries and says, okay, let's see what you guys can do and runs with it. And then she's there to answer questions. She's there to prompt us and push us in a certain direction. Um, you know, she takes the reins, obviously on certain situations like COVID, she immediately came in with a plan. This is what we're going to do. This is where we're going to go. But she gives our staff members a lot of freedom to grow and develop and run their departments how they see fit um, with a little bit of guidance from her. But she's just created that growth environment and that creative environment, which I think has helped us, you know, moved us forward in the right direction. I love that you said she hires people that she trusts and then she gets out of their way. I yeah, think. and she would say that. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is so good. And, and I, whenever I've heard somebody talk about great leaders, it's never like, Oh, they just come in and they do everything. No, it's it's they they trust their people and they get out of the way. And I, I think that's a great point. Yes. The other thing that I love about her, she would laugh because we tell this story all the time. The second day that I started working with her, she and I are great partners. She's a, just become a great friend of mine. But the second day that we started working, I said, you know, I know I'm going to love this place because I feel like I could come to you and say, Ellie, there's a dead body laying at the bottom of the stairs. And you would say okay, well, let's figure it out. You know, like nothing, you know, there's no panic. There's, there's nothing that we can't figure out. It, that's, that's really the environment that we have here, which has served us well in COVID. It's just, okay, now where do we, how do we move forward? We're not going to wallow in this. We're not going to panic. We're not going to, you know, stand still because we don't know what to do. We're going to figure out a plan and roll with it and move forward. I love it. Good stuff. Okay. Let me ask you a little bit about your phased recovery plan. And, and it's been interesting because I know that Tennessee has begun, you know, the cases haven't like gone way down or anything like that, but things feel like they're starting to loosen up just a little bit. So what's your phased plan for coming out of this? So we started a phase plan back in June, actually, which seems early, but we were one of the first states to open. So we had the opportunity to kind of come up with a phasing plan right out of the gate and then almost test the waters with that before I think some other states because Tennessee opened, you know, fairly early. So we have come up over the next year with a four phase marketing plan and we have based that on two sets of metrics. I'll try to not bore you with all these details. <laughs> no, I <but> like it. <laughs> the first set is destination readiness. So that's a pretty obvious one. We're looking at other destinations, our target destinations. Are they ready to travel or not? We're not going to waste our money in destinations that just aren't ready to get out of town. Right. Then we're going to look at our own destination metrics. So what is the spread? Is it low, medium, high? And that our health department has been great with you know keeping that information public and the school systems using that as well. So we'll look at the spread rate. We'll also look at our occupancy rate. Um, there's a couple other metrics that we're taking a look at on a monthly basis to figure out our reach and then our spend at the same time. So um, for example, if we have a high spread, um, we, you know, in a low engagement, we're going to keep things close to home or we're just going to be promoting staycation. That's phase one. If we're all the way open, phase four pre-COVID, we're advertising nationally. So it kind of comes in, you know, different stages. Um, we're in phase two right now, which is medium we've moved to kind of the low face you know low spread but we're still treating it as medium right now where we're advertising to drive markets in particular um, we're not doing any fly markets right now but we're a great drive market destination so we're pouring as much money as possible into those drive market destinations that we know they're ready and then doing a lot of statewide campaigns too because we've seen some research that shows people are really loving to travel the state of Tennessee so we're trying to capitalize on that. I like it. Okay, yeah. you, you mentioned earlier, and we'll get into creative in just a minute, but you mentioned earlier that, that you're really trying to be fiscally responsible as you're rolling out this recovery plan. Tell me how you're approaching the, the financial side of this. So we are fortunate to be funded on an annual basis. I know that some DMOs are funded as you go on a quarterly yeah. basis. So we actually have, have secured our funding for this next year, and all of that funding was pre-COVID which puts us in a position and planning and saving position, yes. which is very, I feel very fortunate to be in that position. Um, cause I know a lot of DMOs are not. So we Can I ask you a quick question. Yeah, of course. So if you're in a DMO that, that is kind of a get approved as you go, as opposed to an annual, how, how can you go about trying to change that with your, with your governing officials? Great question. <laughs> 
<laughs> Here's another surprise for you. I Boom. know. I'm going to have to think about that one for a minute. Um, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to, I think a lot of it starts with your board. So take a look at who's on your board. Do you have, first of all, do you have control over who's on your board and who's not? How much of a say do you have in that? Make sure that you have entities on your board that understand the tourism industry. You have attractions on there. You have restaurants and retail and not just community leaders. You kind of need a mix of both um, so that you have that strong hospitality voice there on your understanding voice on your board. Put, you know, put the right people in the right place and do some behind the scenes work. So start with, you know, have some meetings with those local officials along with your tourism partners to help them understand the economic impact of tourism, what that means, make sure that, you know, the community as a whole, but especially those local elected officials understand that economic impact. That's where it starts is understanding your value, really. And once you can prove that, then the ask of the funding is going to be much easier. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I've never faced that. I've never had to do that before. But I think a lot of it comes into just comes with the buy in for local elected officials. And do they understand the importance of what you're doing? But I think I think your point is really well made when you say make sure that the people on your board are the right people because then you're getting influence to those government officials yes. in multiple places as opposed to you fighting the battle alone. Right. right? And, and so I, I actually think you, you answered that really well as far as how to make that happen. Start with your board. Yep. That's, that would be my advice. Yeah. Okay. I interrupted you earlier. You were okay. talking about uh, funding for next year. Yes. So we are, whenever I was talking about being fiscally responsible, a lot of it comes back to what I said about advertising and destinations that just aren't ready. Right. You know, when as you're reopening, coming out of COVID, you think, oh my gosh, we need to pour all this advertising money into all these destinations. We've got to ramp up tourism. But we have tried to take a look at our um, community as a whole, make sure that residents are ready for tourists as well. So we've done some surveys around that. Um, make sure that we're bringing it back at a responsible pace and that we're spending that money responsibly so that if they're, you know, we need that money now for recovery, but then we're also going to need it in the next fiscal year whenever we're going to feel that true impact of COVID. So trying to figure out that balance of how do we have a really healthy spin to get visitors back here now that are ready, but then how do we save a bit for next year? So we, everything that we're looking at right now as far as financials is concerned is does it, does it turn into an overnight visitor? And if it doesn't, we're not doing it. So we might have had some programs before that, um, you know, ultimately could possibly bring an overnight visitor, but they were, um, you know, didn't have that direct impact, immediate impact. More awareness focused. Exactly. Thank yeah. you. Yes. More awareness focused. And now it all comes down to, you'll hear somebody in our office asking that question every day. Well, does that bring an overnight visitor? Okay. Nope. Cut it off the list. So your real focus right now is direct response. Yes. Got it. Uh, tell me about some of the tools, technology tools that you're using to understand if you're driving visitors or not. So one of our, our digital advertising partner, we just started working with them about a little over a year ago. Um, they're called, their name is Conversant. Okay. And they are helping us along the way to understand um, that return on advertising return on investment. So we're able to see, okay, we've served a visitor this ad or served, you know, this many impressions and this number of people actually visited and then this is where they spent their money. Some of that data is going to come a little bit later in the year, so we okay. don't have access to it immediately. Um, but we're looking, as a lot of other destinations are, on a daily basis at our website. I mean, the basics, right? Yeah. Our website engagement, our social media engagement. What is our online visitor guide? Signups. What does that look like? E-newsletters, because that's a pretty good gauge of interest and in comparing those things to pre-COVID times. Got it. All right, let's talk creative. What, what's your messaging like? So you, you, you determine that a market that you want to advertise in is ready. By the way, I love that you're doing that. I, I think the idea of, uh, and I think a lot of people are, this goes back to research, they're not finding out if a market is ready before they're spending those advertising dollars, and that money is wasted, right? right? So I love that you're doing that. But when you're running in those markets, what does that creative look like? So we, thankfully, are a destination that is actually very COVID attractive, <laughs> if that's a word, <laughs> in, this, in the sense of this is a place where someone feels, would naturally feel safe to come because of the activities and the experience that we offer. 
um, you can social distance. There's a lot of scenic beauty, nature. And like I was saying earlier, it's a place where people can just come and relax and Uh kind of take a deep breath. So we're capitalizing on just the essence of our brand right now. Honestly, what we've always advertised ourselves to be, but we're just being more blatant with it. Um, So internally, we're calling our creative campaign the Come Relax campaign, um, where, you know, we're going to be talking about how it's, you know, everyone's been through such a crazy year. They, you want to go to a place that you feel safe where you're in nature, you're in the, you know, scenic beauty. We have this charming, you know, quaint small town where you can come and make memories with your family and your friends. It's a place where you can just come and relax, but you feel safe doing that. You're not in a crowded kind of, um, I don't know, pent up place that feels scary during COVID times. Yeah. I love it. Okay, that's good. It helps when your destination is already pre-qualified for post-COVID, yes. right? I, I feel like we, oddly <laughs> enough, we were. So uh, I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> yep, that's really good. Really good, especially right now. Um, tell me just, you know, nobody has a crystal ball, right? But I, I'm still going to ask you to look into your crystal ball and, and tell me what you think the next, you know, six months to a year looks like for Franklin, Tennessee. So... I would say the next six months to a year, we're going to see us that slow climb in visitation. I still think it's going to it's going to take some time, but people are itching to travel, especially seasonally right now. We have always been um, a really popular destination around Christmas time, in particular. It looks like a Hallmark, actually, a Hallmark movie was based on downtown Franklin. <laughs> I'm not lying. Okay. So it looks and feels like a Hallmark movie down here. Right. Um, we are working on some programming with our downtown Franklin Association to make that same feeling for the fall. We want people to come here. We feel like October is going to be a great month, October through December for us this year. So we're trying to make Main Street, dress it up a bit, you know, so that it feels like it does at Christmas time and extend that season. Um, And we're working on some programming as well to, to help with that because we've had to, obviously, our downtown Franklin Association has had to cancel a lot of our signature events. So we figured out how can we bring those events, not in event form, but activation form downtown to have some kind of programming to bring visitors in. Yeah. And we've, um, they've done a great job of that. So I think at least now through the end of December, I'm, I expect we're going to see an increase. Um, I think moving into the next year, we're probably in most destinations are going to have to continue on this track of this phased marketing plan. I, I have a feeling this is going to last at least a year, maybe maybe two um i hope not yeah but i think it's just going to be a bit of a long road um i'm hoping that we're going to see a really good bump in the spring obviously a lot of this depends on vaccine and just but people are itching to travel they're ready to get out um they're ready to see the world they're ready for some happiness and some lightness in their in their life and to get together with family and friends in the travel industry i think is going to you know, boom and bounce back as soon as people feel safe and comfortable. I totally agree. I think there's so much pent up demand out there right now that if, if you do a thoughtful and intentional job of planning out your phased marketing plan, like you say, you're going to be able to capitalize on that. And if you sit back and wait for things to get it back to normal, your competitor is going to capitalize on that, right? Yeah. Um, so, Lauren, if you could boil it down to, to one piece of advice or takeaway that you could give destinations that are listening to the show, what would you say? I would say have a plan. Don't just sit back and say, oh, we're just in a terrible spot. The industry's in a terrible spot. I'm going to throw up my hands and there's nothing I can do and this is horrible for us. I would say have a plan, make the most of your situation this is more than one thing, but <laughs> that's all right. Be be proactive, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So plan and then speak into pivot, speak into those activations in your community, figure out what those assets are that are going to be um, desirable for travelers right now and lean into them and put your staff to work, working alongside your associations, figure out as a town, how you can come together and make this a place that people want to travel right now. Don't just sit back, but be proactive. And if your plan blows up, That's okay. That's okay. Just make a new plan, right? Yeah, it's going to blow up, so (laughs) don't be surprised. It probably already has multiple times. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Lauren, Puckett's was a huge success. 
man, this is good food. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for making this suggestion and also making some time to hang with us today and talk about our industry. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was so fun. I'm glad that you liked the food and southern hospitality and whatnot so you won't need dinner tonight because it's a lot of food (laughs) we like to feed you here yeah absolutely well well thanks a lot it's been a lot of fun thank you all right everybody this has been another episode of the destination marketing podcast on the road and had a great episode today we've got more coming so stay tuned in the next couple of weeks and we'll have tennessee very thoroughly represented here on the show so thanks again for listening if you enjoyed today's show please leave us a rating or a review And other than that, we'll talk to you next week. Today's episode is brought to you by Relic. As many of you know, I own an advertising agency called Relic, and we work specifically with tourism destinations. If there's any of you that are struggling with what to do next, or you've tried agencies that don't specialize in tourism, or or if you've been using the local flavor for years and years and you're just looking for something new, I would say give us a call. Give us the opportunity to take a look at your plan, see what you're doing, use our tourism knowledge and industry specialty to examine everything from your brand to your tactical execution and make recommendations of how to help. We'll do that assessment for free. We'll give you those recommendations for free. And if you like what we say, maybe you can hire us to to execute on those plans. So kind of a risk-free opportunity to have us take a holistic look at everything you're doing, provide some recommendations, and you can kind of see us in action. If you're interested in having us do something like that, please send me an email directly at adam at relicagency.com. I would love to set that up with my team.